Bear tacos. Bear taco? Bear tacos? Have you ever had bear tacos, Matt? I've never had bear. I've had a taco. Yeah. So you've never had bear? No. Did you, you know have you could bear? eat bear? You can eat no. bear. Yeah. No, I didn't know that. I just found this out that you can eat bear. I met somebody Did and they're a hunter and they hunt bears mostly. And I was like, okay. that's interesting. And then they, yeah. after they hunt the bear, they cut up the bear, bring all the meat back, and then they just eat bear meat for a while. And I was like, wow. I didn't even know that was a thing. But now I want to try bear. Wow. Yeah, no, look at that. A bunch of states allow for bear hunting. That is wild. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you can um, get a license, you know, and then you're allowed to uh, hunt so many bears a season. I'd imagine mm -hmm. not that many, but uh, yeah. How's, so, what does it taste like? I don't know. I'm going to try and become friends with this person so I can get some. <laughs> Just you can have some bear. Yeah, you All said right. they, they made um, bear tacos. They brought bear tacos to like a party or something like that. And I was like, bear taco how many how many people have had bear tacos man i i definitely haven't i want one now though ever since he said that i swear i've been thinking about it like every 30 minutes or so i'm like yeah i gotta get a bear taco man i just have to know i have to know i didn't know it was possible it's now i know it's possible i don't know yeah i mean they, he said they it tastes pretty good but then again you know it's like people who are like super into goat or something you're like it's okay you know yeah I hear you. Yeah. Goat's not bad, but I find places where you normally get goat, they leave a lot of skin on it. And goat's, Ugh. yeah. Goat skin's no, thank like you. leathery, dude. You're like trying yeah, no, to thank rip you. it off of the meat, you know? It's, yeah. What's the most exotic meat you've ever had, Matt? What's the most exotic animal? Uh, pig? <laughs> <laughs> The rare pig found ah, the, the, the ball for the boar. No, I, I, I don't really eat a lot of exotic things. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've had anything like exotic you could claim as exotic. I've never had like snake or anything. What about uh, like alligator I, I, I or something? Venison. Like, yeah. What's that? What about like alligator or something? You know? Nope. Okay. I haven't, I don't even think I've had venison before. Hmm. So all right, well, pretty, we gotta, pretty tame chicken. Chicken's my go-to. You should just get like a combination sandwich. That's got like venison, alligator, you know, some bear in there. And bear. You can, you can say you've had there, it all. Yeah. One yeah, bite. That, those, that primal meat. <laughs> the primal tenants. I just can't stop thinking about bear meat now. I didn't know. Is I didn't know you could do that. And now I know. And I'm like, well, now I got to do that. Your entire, your entire world has shifted. Yeah, but I mean, I, to get a bear, like, this guy goes out, like, solo hunting for, like, five days. And I'm like, that's crazy, man. Sounds a little dangerous. Solo? What happens if the bear gets you? Well, Apparently guess the, the bears whole, you know... aren't dangerous, but the mountain lions are. You gotta watch out for mountain lions. Well, the like, bears aren't dangerous! Well, apparently the ones where we are won't attack you. Like, they're, they're not generally aggressive, but mountain lions can be. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, if you're like in the mountain lions area. I don't know. What is this podcast about anyway? I don't know. You started this. It's not I, my fault. <laughs> I did. Welcome, everybody, to the Level With Me podcast, <laughs> the podcast that's supposed to be about video games and other things around video game culture. But today we just get started on bear meat. And uh, if you guys are new to the podcast, welcome. You can follow us on YouTube or uh Podbean or Spotify or you know all the podcast spots and if you want to support the podcast we have a Patreon that is linked down below you can click on that and actually watch the podcast live we've got whew, about 2,000 people watching live right now chat's going bananas barely keep up with it but uh, you guys can come over there and then after the uh, podcast we actually have a live Q&A session where we just kind of talk about random subjects that people are interested in so you want to support the channel? Check us out there. And otherwise, what did you do this week, Matt? I did all sorts of things. I played a video game called Body Cam. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I got invited <clears throat> to it, and then I heard the servers were kind of stuttering a little bit, so I I was going to hold off till next weekend to play. Gotcha. So yeah. for those of you that don't know, there's apparently a bunch of games coming out that are trying to make super hyper-realistic 
uh, first person shooters. So it's yeah, like hyper. Like the graphical fidelity is bananas. There was the unrecorded yeah. game so that we saw a while back. Can I clarify what you just said a little bit? Because go for it. Uh, yeah, unrecord feels like it's kicked off this trend almost where yep. it recreated a filter over your camera that looks like a police officer's body cam. So yes. it's a little bit more fisheye. The colors are a little bit more blown out. It kind of looks mm -hmm. like a cheap auto exposure camera. And then the placement of it usually is a little bit lower down so yeah. that your weapon animations and stuff are at a different height. I think generally speaking, um, and so they recreate a visual style that looks like cheap video camera recording, which I would say is a little bit different than hyper realistic. It it feels very real in that it feels like very realistic footage versus. Yeah, but the environment yeah. that you're actually looking at looks hyper realistic, like mm -hmm. the actual like terrain around you, except for like there's a couple of there is a there's a map called Russian building. <laughs> all it's just called russian building and yeah. the lighting and then the uh, like the textures it, if you pause for a second you just look at it and you're like hey what does this look like and like someone was passing by they'd be like it probably just looks like a building like they would probably think it was real life it really does look fantastic and so you've got that kind of visual fidelity on top of the body cam filter for sure and it just makes for a very immersive experience now the contentious point is that um they also try to do something with the movement that is really janky because they're trying to make it feel more authentic but yeah. you're you're so you you aim the weapon and then the like reticle will like keep or like eventually will line up and then you'll aim down sight so it results in this really jittery your character's yeah. just doing this all the time and it's really hard to aim that's which, interesting to hear you say that because whether it was body cam or unrecord, mm -hmm. those games seem to focus a lot on the animation to present it as a realistic looking experience. Yeah. However, as as we discussed, I believe in last week's podcast, is when you go overboard with character animations, it adds this sort of latency and unreactiveness or what feels like unresponsiveness to the character. And you're you're sacrificing visual fidelity for uh responsiveness in some games and then other games you're like it's gonna look super real and then you're playing it and you're like why does it take two seconds to get my gun aimed at anything and turn around right and so basically in this it's really hard to describe it's it's very floaty because of it and so you'll there's no like hip fire or point fire really like there kind of is but mm -hmm. you have to be aimed down sight to do it and so your character goes to like this really awkward transition of your aim down sight, but you have to move your your you have to move the weapon over to the left because there's a guy that just went through the door. But then it takes like a, literally a second for them him them to get like it lined up with the actual uh, like holographic. And by that time they've already taken you out. So then yeah. you need to like just kind of assume where your weapon is pointed is in the right direction. And so it's like this really janky halfway between point yeah. fire and actually aim down sight. It doesn't really work a lot of the times, but it makes for it makes for some intense moments. Like I can't lie. Um, even though I think they can definitely tighten things up and yeah. maybe give you some more options. Um, it's very intense for sure. They're in new territory to a, a degree in that and I was analyzing Unrecords footage when that mm -hmm. they first dropped that trailer and everybody was like, whoa, how is this real? It looks incredible. Uh, it looks like they're doing some form of auto-aim combination in there where it looks like you aim the gun sort of in the general direction of what mm -hmm. the target is. And then there's a little bit of behind the scenes auto-aim happening where the animation kind of lines up with what's on screen there and... It's more just for like, you feel like you're in the moment, you aim at what you think you should hit, and then your character just sort of aims at it and shoots it anyway. So it's like a heavy dose of auto-aim without any of the UI. So I think that's what they're going for in Unrecord. Was some of that with body cam or no auto-aim? I didn't aim? notice any auto. I mean, it could it could have been. It's really hard to tell because of how just floaty everything felt when you were aiming. So yeah. there are moments where, it, I mean, 
I aimed towards it. It looked like the weapon was pointed at them and then they crumpled. So yeah. sometimes it felt like the shot would have been off, but and then they just died. So I, I, I could not say. It didn't feel like there was any auto aim, though. Do you know how long body cam has sort of been announced as a thing? Because I feel, and I could be wrong on this, but as soon as Unrecord dropped that body cam style trailer, mm -hmm. uh, everybody on the internet took notice. And within like a week or two, there was already people saying, hey, how to turn your Unreal Engine game into a body cam style game. And they already had just plugins that did it super quickly. So yeah. I'm like, is body was body cam supposed to be a tactical shooter or did they have the framework for a different game or did they just see what Unrecord is doing and start so, making that really quick or something? I I enjoyed my time with it because it is very unique. It's made by two kids, essentially, a 17 year old and a 20 year old. Wow. And yeah, so which is cool that they've been able to do this and the game was fun. I'm not sure what the longevity of this game is going to be. And I'm also not sure really how much they actually developed because you play the maps and they're not balanced around like a FPS at all. Yeah. Um, like you play on a house and there's one moment where like there's one, there's like two sides and one side allows one team to get on the roof and the other does not. So they'll literally just be on the roof running around shooting you down below and it's really awkward and it just like it's a great map when you're in the interior yeah. because but it just doesn't feel like it was really balanced do you They're think, also young i haven't so, seen it yet and i i am mm -hmm. planning on hopping on but do you think they just used um assets for it because that's i feel what, like they just used assets yeah okay yeah. unrecord had a bunch of that in some of their early demo stuff too where there's tons of hyper they use photogrammetry to like scan mm -hmm. a whole building and then they yeah. upload it to say the unreal asset store you download it, you can throw it into any game, and that game Anything. looks insane, right? You're just right. like, whoa, I just turned on the lumen button and whatever, and now this looks hyper-realistic. So right. I feel like a lot of games do that, and then you play them, and you're like, this is just a weird layout. Like, it doesn't work well for gameplay, and you're like, well, yeah, because it, it's, it's just not an really. asset. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know for sure, but yeah. I will say that a lot of the maps did not feel really finely tuned, and a lot of the game modes didn't feel finely tuned either, where you play, there's like a bomb objective where one team can, they have like this, this bomb that they can place anywhere on the map, which is kind of cool. So you can like run in a corner, you can plant it down, and then the other team can come on in and grab it and then go plant and then diffuse it somewhere else. Like they don't actually have to do it in the room. Oh, so interesting. there's like some interesting dynamics with that, but like they can literally just at the beginning of the round, just plant it. Just yeah. What like at the very start of the round. And then you just hear <laughs> beep, beep beep the entire yeah. time until it's over so you have to like really rush in there and get it so there's it it, fe it feels like it's very early in development i think it's going to be coming out for everyone early access on like the sixth or the seventh or something yeah. so in only a couple of days or even when this uh podcast goes live but yeah i i i think it was cool and i enjoyed myself but it was more of like i it's going to be really interesting to see where this technology goes and what and just kind of a glimpse into what the future could be for other titles that are able yeah. to use this fidelity but on in in a larger in a larger scale here's my prediction and first of all i just want to say good for good for a 17 year old and a 20 year old for making a game that's attracted and we're talking about it right like that's pretty right, impressive right, right. for two two people that young uh to start turning heads on stuff that said i think Unrecord sort of had like the first unique take on this, but it feels like it's going to be like the Blair Witch Project in that okay. if I can use an old reference here, if you remember when the Blair Witch Project, that movie came out and it was all like this handheld recording style yeah. and black mm -hmm. and white. And after that came out, there was like 20 movies that were like, oh, let's do the exact same thing for a while and then everybody mm -hmm. was like i'm sick of these handheld camera movies they're making me sick they look found, awful found footage stuff yeah yep. all that stuff so it sort of was trendy for a little while i feel like the body cam thing is going to be that there's going to be unrecord and then maybe a few other games that can kind of feed off of that a little bit and then people mm -hmm. are going to be like that's fine i don't want any more body cam footage games because as you were pointing out, there are a lot of weird things that happen when you do that body cam style perspective. The aiming gets janky and 
it kind of goes against a lot of the established things that we like about gameplay that have been built up over the past 20 plus years of mm -hmm. FPS development. And this is like, uh, what if we just didn't do all that stuff? And you're like, well, for what? For the sake of kind of a cool visual style. And you're like, okay, that'll, that'll have a little bit of mileage, but I think it's going to burn out. Yeah, especially considering when I was streaming it, I had some viewers the next day be like, oh, good, you're not playing the uh, nauseous simulator. I'm like, yeah, no, I can yeah. see that. For sure, because it's very, not only is your movement floaty, but then the, the, the aiming as well on, on top of that. And it's just, <laughs> it's, there's also some stutters going on. So, but cool concepts. And like you said, I think it, I, I can't wait to see when more games look like that. Just, yeah. just the visuals, not necessarily the gameplay, mm -hmm. because man, people are saying like, what if Escape from Tarkov looked like this? It's like, well, a Tarkov servers would blow up and your computer would blow up because of all the other assets on the map. But one day we might actually get more hardcore games that are like what we traditionally know, but yeah. with that fidelity. Uh, I don't think we're that far off, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> the the latest Unreal Engine tech is like, I mean, they're doing stuff at scale now. That's basically what all of their tech is designed to do now is like, okay, uh, can we do this crazy visuals, but just at an limitless world scale so like unreal engine 5 has a new system called large world coordinates and it mm. basically is it it's making your maps kind of unlimited and making it easier to do that or before you might have had to write some special code or figure out a clever way of loading and unloading things and segmenting it with a huge amount of work to do that now they're just like uh just make a giant world and we'll figure it out you know the engine will figure the it engine out for will do you it. yeah and it's pretty cool. So, I mean, now that they have that limitless scale, they're like, well, can we do that at high fidelity too? Well, that's what Nanite's designed to do. That's what Lumen is designed to do, is to do really, really high fidelity lighting and modeling stuff at scale. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think we're far off from it. I think we're just not seeing the AAA games with it quite yet, because the tech is still relatively it takes a long new. It takes a long time to make yeah. a game. Yeah, a big game company is going to spend three to five years to make their their game on Unreal Engine five. So it's going to yep. take a little while before you see the big titles coming out. But we're not horror far off. games are going to be wild. What'd you say? Horror games? Oh yeah, not N not what you thought. Yeah, I heard I heard something else, but that too mm -hmm. could be wild, mm -hmm. Matt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is that. like, is is the the biggest thing I think is that they're really. Computers are really good at uh, rendering inanimate objects like walls and yeah. tables, and those things are looking hyper realistic. But then you insert like a player model into that, and that's where that immersion will break. And yeah. so I, th I still think we're a long ways away from doing like getting that on that same level as just the environmental detail. Yeah, I will say that is that is one of the features that just got added to Unreal Engine five point four is a much more dynamic character animation system that's supposed mm -hmm. to make animations and animation transitions super easy for even indie teams because that is that's a big difference between indie studios and triple a studios is like having a full animation department that can do mocap and do all these really high right. end animation blending and that takes a high skill set that takes a very specific type of talent and it's usually expensive and time consuming so yep. i do think that's going to become more accessible so Perhaps, perhaps we're not too far off from that, but it is the animation stuff is lagging behind a little bit. The like the lighting and texturing stuff. Well, something I also just uh, thought of is that if you start to add in supernatural or fantasy esque things, you can't take a picture of that in real life and put it in your game because right. it doesn't exist, right? So how do you when you have a super hyper realistic environment based on our own reality, and then you insert things that are not from our reality? How do you make that look and yeah. look natural within that environment without making it look really jarring yeah it takes a good artist basically so you say okay what's our art budget okay it's a million dollars uh we're gonna spend half of that on and then this these are just fake numbers obviously but we're gonna spend half of that on creating these bespoke fantasy creatures that inhabit the world and then the other half we can more or less modify existing assets and photogrammetry like if there's if it's a castle or a cabin like half of that stuff can be done with photogrammetry or right right even cooler is like you can just get the stones and the wood that would be used to build that and then you just build it in engine using right 
those highly detailed assets. So yeah, you kind of have to decide how your budget's going to be spent. If you want to make the cool custom creative stuff look as good as the photogrammetry stuff, it's going to be challenging. It will be. Yeah. But it is cool, man. I'm excited about all the stuff that they're working on now. And it's neat to see all these weird little indie games popping up that everybody's like, whoa, what's this? This looks crazy, yeah, indie man. Indie game that looks like that? Right. Yeah, I know. When you don't, when you don't have that visual barrier anymore and... There's a, uh, I love looking through the Unreal Engine asset store because it's just like, it's like a candy shop, man. You look at, you click on something. It's like, here's a photorealistic forest for like yeah. 40 bucks, you know? Yep. And you're like, okay. Just plop can that I? down into my yeah. game. Yep. You could just make the Blair Witch game and then you just download one forest asset pack and you've, you're halfway there, you know? You're like, yep. well, that's the environment taken care of. What's next? <laughs> pretty much yeah and it looks fantastic that, yeah. that, that, that makes because then you can focus on the game the gameplay and not necessarily the art and the assets part yeah know? it's good for pc gaming for the problem is is like a lot of the nanite and lumen stuff doesn't yeah. scale too well unless you have some really talented engine tech people there who are like yeah let's get this running on xbox or let's get it running on the steam deck and then you're like oh, okay hang on now we actually have to spend some time optimizing yeah. But yeah, PC can handle it pretty well right now. It's cool stuff, man. Did you um did you mm. see that uh Epic or Activision rather uh won their the lawsuit against engine owning? No. Engine owning? Engine owning is a cheat developer that makes Oh good, good, good. I so yeah. I don't really know how that all so yeah, that's great. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's awesome to hear because hopefully that will deter other cheat makers from making cheats. But how does that work in like other countries? Yeah. So this is what I wanted to know as well. Uh, people were kind of celebrating it as like this major victory. And I started reading up on it a bit. Uh, engine owning has been around for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe it's a German based company. I just Googled it before the podcast and that's what I got from it. But they've already been sued by Epic for making cheats for Fortnite. And I think Epic won that lawsuit or something happened with it. But that clearly didn't deter the company. Right. Maybe they stopped making cheats for, for that game. But um, I believe they're getting sued because they are based in Germany versus a company that's based in China, which is where 99% of the cheat companies are based. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of these companies can sue the cheat making companies if they're in the west if they're in europe or if they're in the u.s then they're going to go down and they have gone down uh but if they're in china i don't know how much they can do uh to combat it so yeah it seems like a cool victory the 14 million is nothing to these companies they're like oh we won 14 mil and clearly engine owning I think they're making more than that on this stuff. So they'll probably what I find so weird is that when you have a company or doing something like a company does something horrible, right? <laughs> and they use and and then they get sued. Let's say they make like a billion dollars off of like a loophole or something like something that they're doing that is is uh, is awful. And then they get slapped on the wrist for like a hundred million. You're like, well, that's a hundred million, but they yeah. made a billion dollars off of it. That's just that just sounds like a, yeah, yeah. you know a, a tax of doing business, right? Like. That's not going to solve the problem. What do you mean? Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like the whole big pharma thing over here. Right. With, uh, <laughs> them getting slapped yeah. for getting people addicted to drugs that they didn't need to be on. And they're like, uh, here's a big old lawsuit. And like, how much do you make off of that? Oh, way more than that? Yeah, don't worry about it. Right. Just the cost of doing prison? business. Nobody? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's gross. Super it gross. It is gross. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think cheating is going to get regulated until china gets on board with cracking down on it and i don't know if that'll ever happen because they're china's kind of anti-gaming in a lot of ways a lot of their government they, they are policies yeah, they, are like i think the current policy is like you're only supposed to be able to play for like an hour a day or something like that oh wow like at a certain age or something i don't know i'd have to read up on it but it's gotten like pretty restrictive now obviously there's loopholes around it and i know that people in those countries are able to get around it by doing stuff with their accounts and whatnot to to circumvent it but the general policy over there is anti-video games so if somebody's making cheats that disrupt video games do they care probably not that much right 
Like, oh, this cheap manufacturer know. destroyed our business. And they're like, well, we don't really like your business, so who cares? You know, I don't right. know. I don't know either. It's, yeah, I think I think that's really the only solution is all the countries that harbor have to be on cheap board. makers have to be on board. Otherwise, you just right. have a safe haven for cheap makers somewhere. Yep. Yeah, uh, the guys, I forgot which cheat company it was, but they did like a, a raid of the company. And I think it's some of these raids have been debunked a little bit where it seemed more like a pl publicity raid publicity to show thing. that they were doing things. But the dudes had like a garage full of Lamborghinis and Ferraris, <laughs> you know, they just had Wow, like, sounds like they're having a hard time over there. Yeah, well, I mean, like, yeah, the cheap makers are making so much money, Dang. you know? Yeah. Ugh, it's crazy. It's crazy, and that's why I think all video games should be single-player only. What do you think, Matt? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, it is one of the reasons why... I, well, not one of the... It's, it's a small reason why I do enjoy playing so much variety, is that I don't have to deal with that nonsense, is I can just be like, I can go play a really good single-player game. Yeah. Screw you guys, I'm taking my ball and going home. Yeah, it's true. Playing any good single players lately? Uh, Elden Ring. Elden Ring. Uh, is the DLC out for that? Uh, comes out on the 20th, 21st. So okay. soon, soon. Yeah, so you're just kind of getting back into the I'm groove. Getting, I'm getting prepared for it, yeah. You're doing your whip master character or whatever? Yeah. Still yep. whipping stuff? Still whipping, yep. <laughs> it's tough. That's cool. Uh, whip isn't the best, but it, it's getting the job done. Yeah, yeah. Is the um? I think by the time this podcast is out, the... Destiny 2 expansion will be live. Yeah. You're going to be playing that? I'm going to be checking it out. Yep. I'm hoping that this will be fantastic. It seems... So if, have you followed it at all? Mm, I've seen the trailer. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Yep. I'm I'm hoping that... So Bungie seems to be incapable of releasing two DLCs in a row or expansions in a row that are good. So they usually go like oh, yeah. one good, one bad, one good. So the last one was not great. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't great. Uh, felt more like a tutorial for like one of their like for their new supers mm -hmm. um, and then our subclass. And then so everyone's kind of hoping that this is like the good one. This, this is going to be the good one. The fact that it was delayed, I think, is also good news because I think Bungie also realizes we got to hit this out of the park like this has to like we're kind of they're uh, not yeah. the dumps, but like they got they got this is the final expansion for this storyline, the light versus dark saga and. So they really need to they need to bring their A game. And from the sounds of it, it's looking positive for the most part. Um, the vibe I'm getting is that they're just like going all out on player agency and player customization. You're gonna be able to mix and match all of the different subclasses. Um, so you can have like, you know, a combination of everything where you can use like a void grenade and you can use a uh, you know, electric uh, melee. I can't remember the actual term. And you can then build like this transcendent godlike being where you can uh, just blow everything blow everything up in front of you. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I mean it sounds cool. It sounds like some action RPG RPGs give you a lot more freedom with their character building, but it also mm -hmm. takes a lot more work to get that to work well because you're just sort of opening the floodgates for balance problems essentially. Yeah. Where people combine the crazy stuff together, but that's cool. I think you brought up an interesting point that I wanted to talk about is like, mm -hmm. it sort of feels like what's Bungie's next step. We know Marathon is in the works, but Marathon's a huge gamble, right? They're coming yeah. in very late to the game with some sort of extraction shooter concept, yep. uh, a genre which Bungie has never attempted to take on before. As far as I know, I don't think they nope. have had any nope. Halo DLCs or anything that did that. Um, so it's uh, are they gonna are they planning on Destiny three and it's all just super secret behind the doors? That's or... that's what leaks are indicating is that there's some yeah. sort of Destiny three in the works, which doesn't surprise me. Uh, yeah, I, I they say that this is not the end for Destiny two and that there's going to be more because there's going to be seasonal content that comes after. But it's like, where is that seasonal content going mm -hmm. to go? Because if this is the end, and I'm assuming we defeat the witness, or maybe everyone just dies, and that's it, and GG, they just shut, shut down the servers. It's I don't the see that because they've already... Purgatory DLC. Yeah. You guys all play in Purgatory. The, the, my theory... Well, it's not really my theory, let's be real. Um, but my guess was that they would have transitioned to like finding a new home where may, maybe things go really bad, and they, we, you know, or... 
we win, but at what cost? And we have to go find a home somewhere else in the universe. And so you you end up like in a new galaxy and it's like a whole new story and mm. with new characters. It'd be and a good way to reset. It'd be, yeah. a, it'd be a fun way to do it. And that cause... way you don't have any of your like gear and stuff, which I know some people wouldn't be a fan of, but like at some point, like you would assume they, they're going to have to reset. There's going to yeah. need to be a reset button. Well, are you talking about this will be the DLC or Destiny 3? Destiny I a, 3. Yeah, Destiny yeah. 3, you got to reset. You can't. You, I would mean, assume, you would assume so. You don't take your character from Diablo 2 to Diablo 3. Like it's a right. new game, you know, right. start the new game, people. Um, I think for these types of games, it makes a lot of sense to keep it as hush hush as possible because people are investing money and stuff in their characters. They don't yeah. want you to stop doing that on yeah. the way up to Destiny 3. If they're like, Destiny 3 is coming out next year, and you're like, well, I was about to drop 20 bucks on, on microtransactions, but now I'm not going to. So they they got to zip it until it's like they hit that equilibrium of, we need to start building hype for the game versus making money on the current game. Well, it's fascinating because I think a lot of gamers are now getting to the point where the idea of a new game doesn't excite them as much because they have put so much investment into yeah. their characters. You think some people have spent hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on their character. And it's like, I don't want to lose this. What do you mean? I'm losing all of my progress. Like that doesn't sound appealing at all. Yeah. Uh, which you know, 10 years ago, that was never something that people even really considered. It was like, maybe you get a couple of cosmetics here and there. And like, yeah, it sucks that it's gone now. But like, these live service games have really changed the mentality because at some point, the game is going to need to advance. If there's going to be a sequel, if there's going to be something, at some point, there'll have to be a reset. It's not going to last forever. Yeah. And how do you transition and get people to be okay with that is going to be tricky. Yeah, I think you really have to... It's hard because, firstly, when somebody's making a game, you have no idea if it's going to be a monumental success that goes on forever. I mean, Bungie right. can kind of plan for it a little more than another company could, but even so, it's a pretty big risk. Mm -hmm. So then if you also have a game that looks really good, like Destiny, you're going, okay, well, this engine tech's eventually going to get old and outdated, and then it's yep. not going to be super cool anymore, so... How do you plan for updating the game and all that? I feel like um, World of Warcraft is probably one of the best examples of keeping a single universe alive for so freaking long. But they yeah. also, I wouldn't say future proof themselves. They 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 insulated themselves as best as they possibly could against graphical fidelity upgrades. You know, and I know they have right. done some engine overhauls, but it they have. Um, it hasn't been like making it look amazing or anything. It's just been sort of updating it a little bit. Um, so that, that seems like one of the smarter games in terms of how they planned out for the longevity of it versus trying to hit the and, best visuals all the time and then becoming outdated every five years or so and needing to do massive overhauls that are expensive. And maybe this is where AI comes into it. I just thought of this. I have no idea if this is possible, but the idea of having the art team take all of the cosmetics that you had in Destiny 2, just theoretically, and, and push it into D Destiny 3 would be a, a, a monumental task. Like, it would just be, it would take forever. Like, the amount of content that they've developed in terms of just oh, visual cosmetics. That might not be that hard. That might not be that hard. All of the cosmetic items in yeah. the game and then updated them into a new engine? That wouldn't be that hard? Um, usually when it's a new engine... It's just yeah. an upgraded engine, right? So right. rather than being like, all right, throw Destiny 2 away and let's start over, guys. It'd be like, no, let's take Destiny 2's engine. Mm -hmm. I don't know what engine they're on, by the way. I have no um, idea either. Let's take Destiny 2's engine and look at where it's lacking and make all the big upgrades that we need to. And generally speaking, because all the... Like anything that involves loot and cosmetics and those types of systems probably aren't going to be changed much. You can always add in a higher fidelity model to something and that's not well, that's crazy. what i'm referring to is the model is going to have to be updated that all well, the models would have to be updated uh a little like behind the scenes on most of asset creation stuff is mm -hmm. those models are done at crazy high fidelity and then they're exported at lower levels oh, of detail see look at that no yeah so yeah, no that's a good point there the you go as long as they have are it. there yeah yeah and in yeah, fact yeah. in unreal engine what they do which is really cool 
is you can export the crazy high fidelity model to it. And then the engine just says, we'll just scale it down as needed. Like mm -hmm. we'll just tell you how many polys you want on screen and we'll scale well, it then there, for then, you. Then there you go. Then, that, yeah. then maybe there would be an easier way to transition. Well then yeah. why did a game like, uh, mo so the reason why I bring this up is modern Using warfare. the tiger engine, according to a team. Tiger engine, wow. Ooh, the How tiger do you go engine. from um, modern warfare two to modern warfare, oh, I think it was modern warfare two. There was a transition where they, they you lost all the cosmetic items. At least I think so for Call of Duty, for Warzone when they when they went to like Warzone two, oh, yeah. and it really upset the player base, you know, for obvious reasons. So why didn't they just transition? That, I assume because all of the effort to make all those cosmetic items again and transfer them over would have been a huge task. But from what you described, it wouldn't have been that hard. I don't think so. I don't think it would have been that hard. It might have been. I can't. I don't. It's been a while, so I don't know all the details on mm -hmm. like if it was different studios working on the different versions of the game or how they updated the engine. They might have just done a calculation where they're like, you know what? Uh, Not worth. We'll make more money by just making new stuff and telling people to get the new stuff or yeah. whatever. There could be a billion reasons for that. Um, I don't know, but I... I Importing assets from old games is not hard. A lot of the times, I think the reason why they don't do it is they don't want people to blame them for recycling content, right? Because they're like, oh, this is just a bunch of recycled junk where, you I know, Destiny 2 brought over a couple of legacy items, right? But it wasn't like full on legacy. It was like, here's some cool stuff that you'll remember from the first game, but we're not going to just copy and paste the first game's inventory system over. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, I mean, anyway, that's kind of like getting into the weeds on all of this stuff, but, uh, I'd be curious to see, I, I, Bungie's got to have a good game plan. Destiny 3 seems like the best possible game plan, because it's a huge IP, and any sequel allows them to reevaluate what worked and didn't from the previous game and try and make the next one better, you know, always striving for the best. So having destiny three and then some marathon reboot type thing seems like a decent plan for them, but we'll see. You know what I, I want to so. do is I want to play the original marathon games cause they're, they're on steam now. I think, um, they added them to steam to try and build hype, I think. And I just don't remember what they're about. <laughs> it's been so I long since I played them. Yeah, some yeah, like never, aliens or something. It's basically just like a Doom clone, essentially, but with alien, weird alien stuff. Yeah. Nice. Early did, Bungie, you hear what, man. did you hear what happened with Rainbow Six Siege and their subscription service? No. Why don't you tell me? So, Rainbow Six Siege is still very popular, actually doing quite well right now. Yep. Um... They decided, with their infinite wisdom, that they're going to be getting rid of, I believe, the season pass. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, chat. But I believe they're getting rid of their season pass in favor of doing a subscription service instead. So I think it's like $10 a month, mm. and you get the battle pass rewards for that. I think you get like a, uh, a cosmetic item, like a legendary cosmetic item or something. And uh, each month, you get basically another cosmetic item. Yeah. Um, and I believe it's like 80 bucks for an entire year or 120 if you just did it individually. Mm -hmm. So you could do like a lump sum or just, you know, payment each month. And yeah, um, it just, I'm not surprised is How what much, I'm trying to get at here. What's the cost difference between, say, if you bought every season pass mm -hmm. versus just subscribed? $40. 30 to $40, I think, is what it cost before. So you... you per season pass or for the whole year so for the whole year the, yeah. the entire season the, the season so you would get four deals four of the seasons for 40 in the, bucks in the past for i think 30 to 40 dollars yeah for, that's for actually pretty inexpensive compared to what a lot of other games charge I, I feel like it was on par yeah i think I, it was okay. a, I feel like a lot of seasons are like 20 bucks for their season pass a lot well not, a lot of games really. sorry not because really really what it gave you was just the like the season pass gave you all of the battle passes that's about it and then it gave yeah. you like a cosmetic item and maybe some like in-game currency so it wasn't like it was giving you some crazy deal and most games i think their battle pass is about 10 bucks okay so i think 40 dollars is about is about right 30 to 40 bucks so where the finals was more expensive finals may have been but they are a free game also 
Wait, Rainbow yeah. is free now? No? No. No. Okay. No. And that's kind of what I wanted to get to is that they have now monetized this in every single way I think humanly possible. <laughs> you have to buy the game. You have the in-game currency, right? So you have to pay, you have to pay money to get the currency, which then you can transition to buying things. Yeah. You have items that you can only buy with actual money, right? So you know all that money all that currency you purchased for like a hundred bucks or whatever. Yeah. yeah, you wanted to buy this specific item? Sorry, you can't use that currency. Now you have to spend your own just normal money because I, apparently you I can do that. I hate the billion types of currencies. Me I too. hate it so hate much, it. dude. Hate it. They have that, right? Yeah. They had season passes, which they're now getting rid of because reasons. They've got battle passes. They yeah. had uh, loot boxes. They still have that where you each season will have usually some sort of event where we'll, you'll have like loot boxes that you can buy and you get like a random reward now they yeah. have a subscription service is this, is, this is what happens when the marketing team gets too involved in planning it is out the ridiculous game ridiculous how many yeah. different knobs they're uh, dialing in for money it's like simmer down this is madness yeah i mean here's my take on it and Generally speaking, I, I don't like games that just clutter up all of their cosmetic stuff or their mm -hmm. marketplace. Like, I hate it when you go into a marketplace and you're like, wait, what do I need to get the thing that I want? Is it this currency or that currency? Or I need weird coins and then that <laughs> thing combined with these together to buy the... And you're just like, just let me... Just tell me how much it costs, bro. Like, yeah. give me give me one currency well, or let me that. buy it. They do yeah. that to confuse you and to make it and to make you not know how much you're actually spending when you yeah. when you buy these things. That's the whole. It's it's super sleazy. Is I it really still hate it too. purely cosmetic or are you yes. getting okay? Yeah. So on that front, they get a little bit of a pass. It's just their stupidity for creating such an obscure, complex system that sounds like it's going full on mobile game at this point when it comes to MTX stuff like. You ever booted up Raid Shadow Legends and you're just nope. like, what? what is all this? What is all this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I get why they're doing the subscription because obviously if you can go from $40 and then you can get people hooked on the subscription or forget that their subscription is on and then you get them for either $80 or $120 every single year, like that's a he that's a lot more money that's coming on in, but it feels like they're giving, getting... They're, you're getting less, right? The season yeah. passes um, in each season now comes with less content. I mean, that's kind of been the trend for Rainbow Six Siege, which is inevitable. I'm not blaming Ubisoft for this because that's like you're nine years in. You can't be bringing new maps, new characters like you could at the beginning. Like I'm yeah. not blaming the them install, for that. The install size would be like your entire hard drive, essentially. Right, right. But like content has kind of slowed down a bit. So you're getting less for your less content and you're essentially paying more if you're subscribed the entire time. And that's that just just it's for so them, interesting. Obviously, it's great, but for the player, I don't really know. Oh, also, so yeah. you get I think each season, so like three months, each month will have a unique legendary. And then by the end, if you subscribe for all three months, you get a legendary There's like mother <laughs> ticket card or something like a background uh, or something to showcase that you yeah that, you and did then the you got, whole you, thing. Know, you got the full set it's like ah it's i don't like that it's cringe. i don't like that it's pretty cringe man um yeah. not new tactics but just like unfortunate mm -hmm. it's so interesting to put to juxtapose rainbow six siege with like say counter strike because they yeah. are kind of similar types of games in many ways, but Counter Strike is like less is more is their approach to stuff. Pretty where much, they've just got they got they get skins every now and then, and their DLC is like usually pretty. It's super minimal, and it comes out every once in a while. Um, and then their skins just go crazy high in value, and they're super hard to get. Yeah, but and, you you don't want me to. I I per, so even though yeah. I have all this criticism for Ubisoft and their economy system, I loathe Counter Strike. I yeah. absolutely hate Counter Strike's loot box system because uh, yeah, it's yeah, gambling yeah. for children. It's uh, you're not going to be able to convince me otherwise. It is gambling. For yeah, children. no, I agree. The loot box yeah. thing has been cracked down on. But I mean, EA got slapped around for loot box stuff in FIFA, and I think in like Europe or something, they had to like mm -hmm. actually change their game a bit. Um, I do think loot box stuff need, you know, that's probably going to get cracked down on a bit. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> like Counter Strike's whole thing, like they didn't try and monetize it, but they left it open to be monetized essentially. 
Um, so kind of. I mean, they knew what they were doing. When you when you you can make every skin just be like a dollar. You could just do that because you you yeah. you when you are when you have rarities, you're arbitrarily adjusting the value of it, right? So you make this yeah. thing have a one percent chance to drop or a point one percent chance to drop. You are increasing that value just because you can. Yeah. And that's where I have the problem, right? I, there doesn't you know, need to be skins that are that rare. I don't mind rarity showing um, accomplishment. Like, I wish more games would yeah. do that, where you get the super badass skin if you've gotten a thousand hours in the game, or you've hit a KDR of this ratio, or whatever. Whatever stat mm -hmm. you want to pull from, like, that shows a certain level of of accomplishment in game but um yeah just doing loot box stuff you're like oh so anybody can get it and get their skins or whatever um that said in uh, counter strikes defense ubisoft was trying to get all over this with their nft marketplace bull crap oh, yeah, forever yeah, 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 yeah. ago and they just got yeah. they just got slapped around otherwise yeah. you know that rainbow six would be oh, full of it they tried they yeah. tried to do it and they just got kicked in the nuts by the community repeatedly until they're just like all right let's just stop doing that let's stop yeah they're gonna try and, again and, and, and let me be clear i don't think that if someone someone in chat or watching i don't want your skin that you spent a hundred dollars on to be worth a dollar anymore i'm not saying that he I'm just, just wants this... your skins send them to him yeah <laughs> no, not that either i just don't <laughs> think like this they knew what they were doing when they were setting this up and i just yeah. it just feels sleazy and it just feels gross and I, I don't like it, uh, and I, I don't, don't have to like it. I don't think they could have ever possibly known how much the prices would have gone it, yeah, up. Yeah, they probably, probably just thought people were going to be trading for like a couple bucks here and there on the maybe gray yeah. market, and now they probably weren't like, expecting it to get to the the point that it is today. That's that is a good point. True insanity. It kind of yeah. strikes just a beast that I mean, you just got to study it. You're like this. There's nothing like this right now. This is insane. So. Rainbow Six Siege, still like the game. Don't play it like I used to, but yeah, it's they just have a subscription service now. And yeah, yeah. Eh. you know who does have a good monetization policy that I, I know swear to God, if with. you say Star Citizen, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, they're over seven hundred million dollars now. I mean, it's a good monetization system for them, maybe. Yeah. They have they have a subscription service, so you subscribe and then you get whatever. You, a month, you know, a backpack yep. or some crap. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> they've got... Uh, you can buy your ships outright. You can buy concept ships that aren't even out yet. You can buy in-game currency. You can buy skins for ships. Uh, you can buy armor gear, weapons. Um, you can buy... God, there's all kinds of, like, weird little knickknacks and trinkets and... Well, it's because yeah. Star Citizen currently, even though it's made a lot of progress, is more of a storefront than it is a video game. Mm. Well, I don't know if I'd say it's more of. I would just say their storefront is, like, as storefronty as you could get with the game not being done yet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They've got, like, Rainbow yeah. Six Siege level storefront no, that's fair. I might have been a little 10. hyperbolic, but you know where I'm coming from. I get what you're saying. It's pretty aggressive for the state that the game is in. Yeah. For <clears> sure. <throat> um, but you know what? 700 mil, baby. You know, what are you going <laughs> to... Pump that up to a billion. Come on. Come you on, know, gamers. We, can, we can reach a billion, can't we? They... <laughs> Oh my god, that should be the next uh, ISC Inside Star Citizen episode. Where they're just like, we can get to, let's get another million dollars, Jack. Come on, guys. Yeah. Come on, uh, pump those numbers up, gamers. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Papa needs a new yacht. Yeah. Oh man. But they've been generating over a hundred mil a year, which is wild. That's wild. Wild stuff. Uh, yeah. No news on Star Citizen for the most part. It's It's still doing its thing, man. Mm -hmm. other than the servers not being quite as stable as people wanted the free fly event ended and usually the free fly event is the excuse as to why the servers are not going well after a major update and now the servers are still not particularly stable and oh, no. it's probably just due to their new replication layer tech having issues at scale but you know probably yeah. you hear that uh, call of duty is going to be on game pass that's pretty crazy man uh, I mean, the value of Game Pass is about to go bananas for that. Yep. I mean, yeah. at launch, too. Not even, like, late. Yep. 
at launch on Game Pass. What? How much does Game Pass cost? Uh, sixteen. It depends on your region. I think I don't know the actual amount. You might need to Google that. Game Pass cost. Now, if I had to guess, it's they're going to do early month. access. It's not. Ten bucks a the, month, and you uh, get Call that might of be Duty the basic version. That yeah. might be the basic. Oh, version. do you need like the premium version? I think there might be two versions. I could be wrong. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, I think there's a. Oh, Pass Ultimate is seventeen bucks a month. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that Still, includes I think everything. Seventeen bucks a month to get not only COD at launch, which is, I assume, single player and whatever else they're tacking on to that zombies mm -hmm. and Royale. Who, who knows? Multiplayer and yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, plus every other game on Game Pass, which is like no, ga massive. yeah, Game Pass slaps. It's I I mean I've I've been subscribed to it for a long time now. Yeah, over a year I think. Because it's, it's pretty just, good. It's good value. I've played yeah. a ton of games I normally would not have played because they're on that they're on that service. I will say I'm still blown away that Sony seems like they're they're dominating Xbox. And I don't know if that's just because it's like it's so popular over in like Eastern culture where I think the PlayStation is so heavily dominant over like the Xbox there where the Xbox has made decent inroads in the U S and more and in Europe, but just like the foothold that PlayStation has established is just like, I don't know, like personally I've, I've gone for Xbox more recently cause it has more of the features that I like and it. It does more things that I like from it. Um, and then it's got that windows game anywhere type hybrid setup where I can buy a game on one platform and play them on both. So like, it makes a lot of sense and it just, I'm personally surprised that PlayStation has still maintained such dominant force over Sony and so many, or uh, over uh, Microsoft and Microsoft. So many ways. Yeah. Well, I think so. This console generation has been really weird because we haven't, it feels like we haven't gotten many exclusive PlayStation 5 games. And a lot of people haven't even adopted PlayStation 5 and even like the new Xbox as much. So I feel like PlayStation's lost steam, at least in my corner of, I mean, it could just be my own echo chamber, but yeah. it's, it doesn't feel like as dominant as it was during the, the PS4 days, but also it's not like Xbox is really doing anything to capitalize on that because they, all they have right now is Game Pass. Like that's, they're not really bringing any other titles to compete either. So yeah, I, I don't know. Um, as for Call of Duty, I'm really curious I first think that there's probably going to be some sort of reason to buy the normal edition, like just to buy it outright. Yeah. Because I would not be surprised at all if they're like, oh, you can get it on Game Pass, but if you want it three days early, you have to buy the deluxe edition. And you won't get any of the cool skins. And right, right. maybe you'll be, yeah, you'll be one week behind in all the new mm -hmm. DLC updates or some crap. Wouldn't be uh, surprised if that is a thing. Yeah. Also, what I'm curious is if, let's, let's, Let's say there, there isn't like a deluxe edition where you can get early access and, and most people just get it from Game Pass. What is that going to do for like sales? Like is are yeah. they gonna take a big hit? Is this going to be something that actually keeps people engaged for Game Pass a long term? This could be like either I think this will be massive for Xbox and Microsoft, or it could be a huge a pretty disaster. big gamble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what um so I tweeted tweeted out the news, and that's what most of the conversation was about where they're like well i see microsoft activision uh shutting down lots of cod studios in the near future because yeah normally people are buying cod at full premium price like either 60 bucks or for the like crazy you know hundred dollar versions that you yeah. can get that's a lot of money that's like a year's worth of uh game pass potentially right for a single game purchase it's a gamble for sure. I, I I wonder what the monetary conversion, where they're making up for it. Is it that they're going to go, okay, well, people are going to get Game Pot, people are going to get Game Pass to get COD instead of just buying COD out, right? And now once they're in Game Pass, they'll see the value of Game Pass and they'll never give it up. And that's right. the gamble, right? It's right. like they have to stay with Game Pass for over a year, something like that, like half a year or more to make up i know recoup that but even so if they're staying with that game pass for over the year that means they're playing a bunch of games that they're also not paying for paying for right so yep. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I'm sure there's somebody on the back end has done the math, and I don't know what their financial model is, but it seems like they could be giving up a lot of money, you know? Well, I think it's two things. One is you're potentially picking up a lot of people that would never have played Call of Duty, and they're mm -hmm. going to buy it specifically to play Call of Duty for the first time. And they're like, I, well, I'm not going to spend $60, $70 on a new COD because I don't play it, but I'm totally down for spending $17 to $15 to try it for, for my very first time. That's a good point. And then microtransactions. Yeah. They probably make a lot of their money just strictly from microtransactions. And yeah. so if they can just get people engaged, if they can just get people in there, then it's like, oh, well, I didn't buy any, you know, I, I didn't spend all the money on the game. I might be a little bit more willing now to fork over some money for microtransactions. And then once they got you doing that, then you're hooked, right? Do you think um, this could be another angle? If you're, you know, you're, you're working your job at, um, mm -hmm. Kinkos making copies for people, living paycheck to paycheck. That was, that was you, right? You were you worked at Kinkos. Yeah. I worked at Kinkos, man. I made copies for people, and uh, <clears throat> you got your PlayStation Five, and and you see COD coming out for essentially almost for free on Xbox, and you go, hmm, how much does hmm. it cost? Like, how much can I sell my PlayStation for? How much does an Xbox cost? Are you now doing the math? To maybe convert I, over. Do you think a lot of people will like sell a PlayStation and switch consoles just for that? I don't know if they would. That that's what I'm asking, maybe. right? Yeah, I'd be curious. Let us know, chat. Let us know what what you would do if you're a PlayStation fan. Like, is that is that something that makes you consider switching titles, switching I mean, console maybe if, platforms? If, you, if you're just a Call of Duty player, like there is a lot of just COD and Madden players out there. Yeah, and the idea of well. I could just subscribe and I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. Then there's also a ton of know? people who haven't adopted the latest generation of console as well. So yep. those people who are maybe still thinking about the, the upgrade are going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to go Xbox this time because yep. yeah, look at that. It's a good point. Yeah. Very good point. It's hard though, because they're, it, it's like Apple and Android, right? iOS and Android. It's, once you're committed to one of those ecosystems, switching is so hard, and I think it's the same with Xbox and PlayStation. You've just got... But Xbox is better with backwards compatibility, so I feel like once you're in that ecosystem, it becomes more alluring to stay in it. But then it, you still have got all your PlayStation games. I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's a gamble. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see how it turns out, because I don't want Microsoft to fail. But yeah, no, I do, th I do think it's going to be a risk. Yeah. Um, as somebody who's not a huge Call of Duty fan, mm -hmm. I don't care that much about the future of the franchise, but, <laughs> so That's I'll just fair. be watching it, like, eating my popcorn, I don't, you know? I don't think it's gonna die because of no. one, one bad launch, because they, they, they took a, a chance. I don't see yeah. that happening. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Ah, uh, shall we, uh, shall we switch gears a little bit? To talk about killer clowns from outer space? Let's let's talk about those clowns, baby. That's what I've been what I've been waiting for. What is it with you and all your weird games? You know, you're, what do you mean weird games? You're it's playing great. your supermarket simulator one day. You're selling uh, Cheerios to people, and now you're yep. killer clowns from outer space. What's the deal with this game? So it's a I be, I believe there was a movie, and I, actually I know there was a movie called Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and they turn it into a video game where it's sort of like a Dead by Daylight, where there's three killer clowns wandering around the map trying to find humans who are trying to escape just like you would in Dead by Daylight by doing little tasks around like trying to find uh, like fuel for a boat and a spark plug. You get all three of those doing little yeah. tasks, and you can like you know vacate the premises and you win yeah uh it's a cute little game it's not balanced there were some weapons that were just straight better than others and like would just completely dominate and it was like oh that wasn't fun at all yeah um yeah it's got some interesting mechanics i got early access from the de well, it's kind of there so it's really weird because the devs gave me access. You got, but the, you got the clown pass? Let you in early? I, yeah, I got the clown pass. No, the, the <laughs> it's clever. <laughs> I like that. Uh, it's not early access. It's advanced access. Weird, right? Like it's a new thing on Steam, We don't I need guess. any more torrent. Is that no, we new? don't. Is that on Steam? I think Steam? it might be new. Advanced Advanced access. access. Steam. Yeah. So it's not, it's not technically early access. 
So I'm imagining it's like what Call of Duty would do, like you were just saying, where if you get like the deluxe edition, you get like three days advanced access. I think it's yeah, like that. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, early uh, access is like you play a version of the game that's not yet done. Advanced right. access is you pre-order it and you get the pre-order bonus of playing right. it a couple of days early. Okay. Ex exactly. Just terminology. Yeah. But it also makes things a little bit more confusing because, you know, that's what we need in the gaming industry. It was, it was fun. I, I am on the fence. It's $40, which I think is a mistake. Mm -hmm. I think 40 bucks is pretty cheap. Like if this was $20 and you wanted to play with some friends, I could see you could convince some buddies to pick it up. But 40 bucks is like, that's a bit more of a commitment. And I don't know if that was the right call to keep it at that, you know, at that price, but maybe it'll turn out well. It, there was people, I was cross platform. So I was playing with people on Xbox and PlayStation, which was fun, but it was, uh, it was a goofy I think time. That, I think that's the angle on these games because it's a horror, what? kind of extraction-y style game or something it's i mean it's yeah it's or it's survival. like Te texas chainsaw yeah, or okay. dead by daylight i mean that's it's literally those games combined these games are flash in a pan right like you can they're only going to be popular for like four months tops and then so they got to make their money while they can like i guess yeah how many people are buying these games like a year later like it's probably pretty minimal well know? dead by daylight is a monster of a game that just doesn't oh, yeah. seem to want to die but you're right for other games like texas it it has dwindled to a very small amount of players yeah yeah i'm just generally pretty unfamiliar with this genre because i i'm not a huge horror game fan but i i could see the the fun and camaraderie you know like horror games with teammates is more fun yeah dead by daylight still has forty three thousand concurrent players right now and that game came out in 2016 that is wild man yeah good for them yeah. huge so there's there's fun to be had yeah but it is a little janky to say the least very actually it's very janky the devs yeah. kept i got some emails from the devs saying that they're going to be doing a one like a 1.0 1 update um which kind of annoys me that you would have advanced access and you wouldn't have like the complete oh. version of the game it's yeah like, that it's, is annoying. it's either ready or it's not why are you why are you doing this now you here's know? the question can you get advanced access to early access that's oh. what i want to know there you, there you go i yeah. don't know about that that's what one. i'm gonna do for my video game <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you buy the Supreme Bundle, you get advanced <laughs> access to the early access, and one day we'll even get 1.0 out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I did have some really fun encounters, though, because it has VoIP uh, proximity. So oh, I was yeah. playing as one of the clowns, and then I just had this guy, like, role-playing um, as a human. And I think he was another streamer, so he's a little bit more animated. And yeah. it was it was a highlight of my night. Um, so it's it it has its moments. I don't want to dunk on it too much because it's even though it's got some jankiness, it it has also some charm if you yeah. like those kind of games. Yeah, yeah. So um, I played some other games. I've I've been checking out in Everspace Two. Kind of interesting. Mm. It got a DLSS three update recently, so I thought I'd jump in, but not far enough into to weigh in too much on that one. It's just like a looter shooter in space, essentially. Nice. Um, that one's cool. But I did watch some uh, some interesting movies. I watched Civil War. Have you you've seen the previous oh, to that no, one? No, I right? haven't. No, I heard it was actually pretty good though. It was good. Um, I the the trailer makes it look like very much a pandering movie of just like, hey, you guys want to see the U.S. in a full on civil war fighting each other? Yeah, yeah. Not not our our previous civil war. A new modern civil new war. New modern, modern one, day. Right. Uh, really well done, very creepy, felt super authentic, which is the most disturbing part of the whole thing where you're like, crap, this is probably what it would be like. <laughs> right. So that right. was the most disturbing part of the whole thing. Um, it was very interesting cause it wasn't really, it didn't get into the politics of it, which I thought was clever of them. Yeah. Yeah. They don't go into the politics. So they're not like, oh, it's the Republicans versus the Democrats. You know, it wasn't that it's probably for the thing. best. Oh, for sure. A very, very tactical choice there. Um, and so I did see a trailer moment where one character, he's like looking over these people and he's asking, what kind of American, what are kind you? of American are you? And I was like, oh, damn. I was like, damn, that, that was good. It was well Jesse done. Jesse Plemons. That actor yeah. is fantastic. He's good. He just, he, the way he's able to just convey like a creepiness and like ominous, uh, you know, about him is, is whew. He's very yeah, good. He's great in everything. I like him a lot. Um, 
and he's creepy as, as heck in this movie as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they, they, there's definitely some, there is some stereotypes in there where you could sort of imagine which faction represents which group of people and stuff like that, but it's not mm-hmm. too heavy handed. It's not slapping you in the face with it. Yeah, some of the scenes are, yeah, maybe, maybe so, but otherwise, it just, it does it in a way where you're like, God damn it, everything in this feels really real, <laughs> like it could happen. Uh, it's almost like a warning, but it's not told in a way to like glorify it. It's like the movie's sort of like, look how stupid we are. <laughs> like, yeah, look how dumb. Look, look how at all these just, idiots fighting over we, this stuff. We could, we could yeah. just, you know, avoid this by communicating yeah. and, and, and trying to solve our problems in a peaceful way. Yeah. Yeah. But a uh, really well shot, very convincing film. Um, you know, I could see military people coming in and being like, "That's not how you wouldn't fly a helicopter." Oh, you know, yeah. And I, you gotta, felt you gotta like have that some a, suspension yeah. of disbelief. You gotta, you gotta realize it is still just a movie. Yeah, they had to have some scenes that were kind of like amazing, sort of, you know, where you're like, "Holy crap!" Like, yeah, it's it's the American military forces like fighting in giant urban environments, like which is cool, which yeah. is a cool idea, which is why you know, like the previous Call of Duties were so interesting back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So that was good. That gets a recommendation for me. Um, nice. Solid film. I also watched Ferrari because we were talking about racing stuff a bit ago. And I, somebody it's in just chat, called Ferrari. Yeah. It's about um, what's his name? Enzo Ferrari. The guy who hmm. started Ferrari, essentially. Yeah. Um, is it Enzo? I think it's Enzo. Mm. Uh, I just watched the movie yesterday. I'm like, what's his name? Um, that was OK. It was it wasn't bad. OK. But it was an interesting part of his life to talk about because I had read up a Wasn't little. Was he like a tractor manufacturer? No, uh, I don't think so. Wasn't um, there? Wasn't there like some car company that was a tractor? Like they they really just did like tractors and farming equipment, and then they're like, "We're making cars now." Or am I completely off base? Mm. I probably am off base. Well, maybe I I thought so. Enzo was a racer, and then he started. Then he worked at. Um, it was another company, like, uh, I forgot another car company, and then he started Ferrari after that. So I don't think he did tractor stuff, but, um, what's... Lamborghini, what's inter- that's it. Oh, okay. Sorry, okay. my bad. Yeah, no worries. Ferrari, Lamborghini, like, yeah, you know, g- 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 cut me some slack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the movie's, the movie takes place, uh, during, basically, uh, like, Ferrari at multiple points throughout its history has been on the verge of bankruptcy and somebody's bailed them out or bought part of the company or something like that. Um, And this is sort of another uh, period in history. I think it's in the 50s. And it's it's interesting. It's sort of talking about, you know, needing to win races to sell cars and trying to, like, just scrape by to keep the company running. And it's an interesting, like, look at... um, I keep wanting to saying Enzo Ferrari, Enzo Ferrari, yeah, yeah, Enzo Ferrari. Um, that's it. It's an interesting look at him and sort of his personal life and who he was, but also it doesn't cover what I think has got to be the most interesting part of his life by far, which is that he started Ferrari going into basically on the lead up to World War II, and during. Oh, wow. and it's in Italy, so you got yeah. Mussolini and yeah. like, like, yeah, you're part of the Axis powers, right? Uh, and he had to play apparently both sides of the political spectrum to pretend to be like in the fascist party and then like also pretend to be with the socialist party. Although I don't think he was pretending. I think he was actually against the fascist party and but was pretending to be allied with them. And then his factory was getting used in manufacturing stuff for like the Germans at certain points. And then like he was playing, he, there was an, somebody put a hit out on him, like a political assassination. And hit none on of this him. was in the movie. Yeah. And he had to like, apparently bargain his, he had to actually pay off the guy who put the hit on him to not kill him or something like he like bought his way out of it. So he's like a master businessman that was able to like somehow keep, the Ferrari business alive during World War II. Yeah, I can't and believe then, it actually survived all that. Yeah. And See, then that transi- sounds like an interesting story. Way more interesting. And then this story was just like, hey, let's cover a couple of racers at one random time in Ferrari's history. And 
and whatnot. And there was some interesting stuff that happened, but when I read that up, I was like, that would have been so much more interesting than the kind of relatively boring part of his, you know, it's like there was affairs and that kind of stuff happening. And I'm like, that's nowhere near as interesting as I like mean, yeah, barely survive level cap. Come on now. I mean, the affair had been going on forever. He, he had a son with, a, I think an American woman during mm. world war two or something like that. And he like kept it from his real wife for like years and years and oh, years. Damn. Oh, damn. Uh, so it's not, a, not a good person. <laughs> no, not great. Not really yeah. good. But yeah, just kind of a depressing story and whatnot. Do you but... realize there's like there's some guys out there that have like two families. And it's like how do you even yeah. manage that? Yeah, that's what and, he had. And, yeah, like legitimately two families that they like travel between. It's like how did you juggle yeah. that for a decade and not get caught? First you know of all, what's... you're an asshole. Second yeah. of all, you're yeah. weirdly efficient. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that blows me blows me away is like. The people, the guys that have two families, some of them have more families is like, firstly, this is way more common than I thought it was. Like, oh, apparently it's pretty rampant. Like, I'm not saying everybody, every dude around there's got like multiple families, but you don't have to go that far to find somebody that this has happened to. That's and wild. I, I'm just like, I'm both like one year a monster, but yeah, like you said, I'm just impressed with the logistics of it. Yeah, the logistics of it. Like, how yeah. do you keep this ruse up for so long? You're living two lives and neither family knows it? Like, that's yeah. insanity. Uh, yep. And why? What's the point of it? So, like, how much energy do you have? Do you have that much energy to be... The, oh, my God. Bro, it's... I have a hard enough time just taking care of myself, let alone kids... <laughs> And then, and then on top of that, someone else's kids, you know, yeah, from a different family that I started. It's nuts. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, how crazy would it be if you just like found that out? Uh, you know, you're just like, oh, I'd be, I'd be devastated if, if, if my, if my wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was, there was some of that in my family tree. You know, go back a oh, wow. couple, a uh, couple of. Parents and grandparents, and you're like, okay, interesting. And like some of that stuff was like kept secret until they're like on their deathbeds, too. And they're like, by the way, by the way, I slept with your aunt, sister, great uncle. Yeah. What it's the like, hell? By the way, you have tons of brothers and sisters. <laughs> they live in this state. And you're like, what are you talking <laughs> what about? What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine that, though? Just like your entire perception of somebody, like, change like just on their deathbed they're like by the way i wasn't this cool person that you thought i was i'm the world's biggest a-hole goodbye yeah. forever yeah well i think they probably just want to get off their chests you know they've been living for so long yeah it's wild stuff though man it's wild stuff i uh speaking of movies i watched uh godzilla minus one have you seen that one no um is that the robot fist one no where king kong gets a robot fist no, no this this is a, J a japanese film actually it is all in japanese yeah and it is it is fantastic yeah i uh yeah it's really good it is a great story in of itself and if even if godzilla wasn't in it i would have been entertained um the one thing i will say is that japanese culture with the way that they have you know that they're acting can yeah. be a little over the top uh, yeah. They overact, and I think that's a Japanese cultural thing. So it's not—it's not inherently wrong. It's just you coming mm -hmm. as an, you know American, and you see that you're like, this is a little over the top. But then once you get past that, you're like, this is really engaging. Yeah. And I cared about the characters. Um, there's there's like some moments where I'm like, eh, eh. But like Godzilla <laughs> is terrifying in this. Yeah, he like he is a menace is it the same premise generally speaking like godzilla's around and they gotta like take him down or what yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely but like his i've never seen his like laser breath ability yeah you know when he like charges up yeah. conveyed in this of a de like as a as devastating as it is i saw i think the trailer for it and it's like a nuke or whatever yeah when he, it's he charges up and it's like wild yeah. yeah and he just like hits stuff and you're like oh we're not gonna like dive behind a rock when that no. comes yeah nope you're gonna be yeah. vaporized <laughs> yeah it was it was in like awe inspiring i'll like, have to check that of, out yeah and I, I mean i think i believe godzilla was a 
um, an allegory. Is that the right word? I don't know. Uh, to the United States and their nuke, their their nukes. Right, oh. like it's a representation. I, I, I could be wrong. Could be wrong. Oh, I didn't um, know but that. Godzilla is like a representation of the United States' um, nuclear firepower, and so to see Godzilla literally just basically nuke stuff, um, yeah, is like, oh yeah, no, I could see why this would be horrifying. As like, we're the monster, right? Yeah, that's cool. I'll, Great I'm film. A, I'll I'd check that out it. then because I really can't stand the like godzilla versus king kong crap that yeah. they're like no i, I feel out. you <laughs> like yeah, i feel you there's fun scenes in it I, I wish i could just like watch that scene of the movie and then just turn it off because everything leading up to and beyond the like cool action scenes in those films is just like yeah yeah no thank you you know cool i'll, I'll put godzilla minus one on the list i'll check it out man the trailer did look cool but i had no idea you never know from a trailer yeah, as I said, the overacting can be a little jarring at times, but like once you get past it, it's it's a it's a it's a good film. I liked it. Locked a yeah. lot. And I also watched Avatar Way of the Water. Uh is that a new one? No. It's been out for a couple of years now. It's uh the Avatar you know, the Avatar movies, Blue People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 way of the okay, okay. I was thinking last airbender thing. Got no, it. no, no, no. Yeah, way, of the, way uh, of the Water is the the sequel to the first Avatar movie. Got it. Yes. What did yep. you think? How long? How long is it again? Three hours. Yeah. Of pure cinema. Yeah. <laughs> it is the most beautiful movie I've ever seen. Ever. It is gorgeous. Yeah. And I like it. You're basically just watching art. Yeah. Like in real time, and it like the amount of like attention to detail too that these artists conveyed throughout the entire film is just mind-blowing and then they like it's the small things too where there's like so many like bombastic moments but they're well choreographed and mm -hmm. it's not just you know we've got a really large budget but we've got a large budget and we've thought it through yeah where, like a, a like a vehicle will crash and there's people like on the deck of the vehicle like trying to get out of the way and you're I, seeing yeah. them jumping off and it, it's not just like a like a, a sterile environment where there's explosions it's yeah there's people and oh it so much was, eye candy in that movie yeah because you're like yeah. you can just stare off at the sides of the screen while people mm -hmm. are talking you're like that's cool what the heck is that thing out there mm -hmm. that's awesome yep yeah and I, it's like 90 percent of it is is cgi but you wouldn't know because yeah. you're, you're just so engrossed in the film I mean, like 99% of it is yeah. CGI. Yeah. It's, it's aliens it's, it's on an alien planet. How much, how many real people are in there? There's like a couple of real people walking around. And, and it, no, like there's a couple of points where like, oh, that does look very CGI, right? There's a few moments yeah. where it, it the, the illusion sort of doesn't crumble, but it, you know, you kind of see a, a peek behind the curtain sort of moment. But yeah. it's, and and the story was good, like very basic mm -hmm. story about a family being you know sticking together, but like just just a really solid movie. Yeah. I I loved it. Yeah, I felt the same way, dude. It feels kind of like um, it's like animes have been around forever that explore all these fun fantasy and sci-fi concepts mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. can as animation, and so right. you're sort of used to that as an anime fan of getting to do all these wild things. Uh, because it costs the same to animate a sci-fi thing as it does to animate Which something. is why you can have Attack on Titan in an anime, yeah. but you can't really have it in, in like, real time or live yeah. action. Yeah, it costs you a fortune to make right. that look good. And then James yeah. Cameron gets, like, 500 million bucks to make a movie. And <laughs> you're like, whoa, this is like, what if somebody... With <laughs> it the... really, it feels yeah. like an event. Like, yeah. these these are the kinds of movies that just do not get made because you can't make them. Or at least it's it wasn't very possible because of the cost and the vision of it and they did it and you're like damn thank you this is this was just a joy and a treat to watch yeah and he's got i think it's two more coming like, at least two isn't there might insane? be more yeah it's, it's so nuts insane. yeah i know i don't know what's happening with the movie industry right now like obviously it's a slow death i think but uh we're still getting these epics like dune and avatar that are just like like all the money is like getting split to like just mega movies and then like weird little indie films and there's mm -hmm. like very little in between in between yeah yeah so it's like i like the mega movies oh man we were talking about that last podcast about mad max 
bombing at the box office. Has it done any better since then? I think it's got to do, no, I think it's going to be a huge financial loss. And I think they're already talking about pulling the plug on the sequels for it. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Which really sucks because I liked it a lot. I'm like, cool, I want to see more. I want to see more. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, says it, it says it's generated 114 million worldwide now. Yeah, but so it's better. Uh, That's better. It's than better. The 32. Well, so right? I think I think I think a lot of those numbers are weird. People said it needs to make like actually somewhere like four to five hundred million worldwide. Well, it says it. It says like the price tag was 168 million. Yeah, which but is, so, so they're I, not even hitting that yet. What I'm wondering is when they say generated that much, if that's actually ticket sales or if that's what they how get. much they actually made. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I hear you. So I don't know. I hope they can keep making those movies though, because it's just such a fun universe. But yeah, it could have a second life with DVDs or like Blu-ray, but that's kind of on the that's getting phased out too. Unfortunately, that was yeah. kind of how a lot of these smaller in, these smaller uh, movies could be made. Is that even if they weren't able to make all their money and the theaters, they had the fans to come on in and then had like a second life with the with the Blu-ray, and that's become less prevalent. Yeah. Yeah, right. They don't make all that money. So then you got to wonder what the streaming they're trying to it's become streaming deals, right? It's like who gets the rights to stream it or does it just go out for rental on like Amazon or something like that? And yeah, uh, and obviously piracy is so prevalent now that people who don't want to pay don't have to pay essentially. So, uh huh. Yeah, no, it, it's it's rough. I hope I hope the big movie industry can stick around for as long as possible because i want as many movies like avatar as possible like just keep making avatar movies i'm i'm good with that <laughs> i'm here for it baby they're fun like yeah they, they don't are, need they to are be... fun yeah like it's just a good time yeah uh that's what always kind of cracked me up about the critics on the avatar movies is they're like it's kind of a already been told story that's not yeah, doesn't really same add with much. every like, story like yeah. you don't know the you don't notice the parallels yeah. in every story yeah they're like, all the same in some way ways to this magical exactly. world exactly just yeah. enjoy it you know yeah it's all like it's hamlet or whatever you know like they're just taking all the all the classics and just putting it in space or putting it on some alien jungle planet like it's all the same stuff but enjoy it enjoy it with yeah. its twist and it's i did a different take yeah I know, like, that movie's so long, but at no point was I, like, kind of like, all right, let's get to the point already. Like, you're just sort of, like, just engrossed in the world, which is, yep. um, I find it rare for me with movies nowadays. It's Especially like, a long movie like that. Like, it yeah. was, it was one of the reasons why I hadn't watched it, because it was like, I gotta allocate three hours to a movie, you know, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I heard that the, um, the author of the rising red rising books, like apparently those movie deals have been like in the works for a while or something. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah. At all. So I hope they do it justice. Good. Yeah. God, damn it. Now that I'm on the third book, I'm sort of, I'm like, yeah, I'd be down for, a, I mean, they can mm -hmm. never do it justice in a movie, but feels like it could be a game of thrones the, show versus a movie because i think it'd be better as a show yeah. yeah too many characters too many plot lines too much stuff happening like you you have the game of thrones level of houses and characters that all need backstory and character build up otherwise it's just not going to have the impact that it needs you know mm -hmm. we'll see who knows? Maybe they'll do a crazy like Dune is like two movies for one book, right? Right. So maybe they would do something like that. Or and they're each... long movies too. Yeah. They're not. They're not short. Yeah. And I feel like Dune even left out a bunch of stuff. You know, because mm -hmm. uh, you just can't say you can't do it all. You can't say everything. There's a lot of inner thoughts and stuff to to get across. But yep. Oof. Yeah. Good, good, good stuff coming out, man. I'm excited for the next Avatar. I don't know. I don't know what movies you're you're looking forward to, but I'm mostly just enjoying the third Red Rising book right now. I'm like, I love it, man. Yes. It's yes, fun. Yes. It's fun. I'm uh, glad. Yeah. Solid recommendations. Shall we, uh, we, shall we wrap up? We can up? talk that after for, uh, you know, here in a minute, once we're uh, in the post stream section. Yes, yes, we can get into some of those red rising details and uh 
My, and Formula E, I want to talk to you about Formula E uh, in the post-podcast section, Matt. Sounds good. The future of racing. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching the podcast. We appreciate you very much. Again, if you want to support us, you can do so on Patreon, or you can just subscribe and like the video and do all that stuff to help other eyes get on it. And Matt is going to quickly Google some advice that he can leave you with today oh, oh yeah Go <laughs> google advice my advice is uh especially as you get older is uh make an effort at uh keeping in contact with your friends um as you get older things drift away respond to those emails respond to those text messages don't let them sit on read for a week or you know whatever um because friendship is important and man is it easy for those to slip yeah yeah matimio okay <laughs> no, sorry, level cap. I didn't. I didn't mean. I didn't mean to leave you on. Uh, yeah, yep, yep, nope. I'll send this man text messages and like. <laughs> I may as well be sending a courier pigeon out to nowhere. <laughs> hey, like, and then I'll ask you about it and be like, "Oh yeah, I got that." I'm like, okay, he just didn't want to respond to it. Yeah, That's yeah cool. I'm, I'm speaking. I'm speaking for personal experience here. <laughs> Learn from my mistakes, Chet. Uh, it is good advice though. Good advice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you kind of got to make an effort to do it, but it is worthwhile. Keep those friendships around. Long-term friendships are, are valuable in life. Mm -hmm. Good advice. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>